As we continue in our study of, of Romans, we're nearing the end and we come to Romans 16, the kind of passage that you might in your devotional reading just skip past, but it mustn't be because there's treasures here, there's gold here for us in understanding the heart of God. Romans 16, verse 1. Now I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is also deacon of the church at Sincrea, in order that you might receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in the matter in which she has need of you. For she has herself also been a benefactor of many, and of me myself. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their neck on behalf of my soul, whom not only I alone, but also all the churches of the Gentiles thank. Greet also the church of their house. Greet Eponidas, my beloved, who is the first fruits of Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kindred and fellow prisoners who are esteemed among the apostles and who were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those of the house of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my compatriot. Greet those of the house of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved one who worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, the elect in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. That's a translation by scholar Douglas J. Moo. Well, a word of welcome to uh, everybody at all our campuses. So glad to be with you and everybody that's joining us online. Are you ready for some good news? God made humanity male and female, and he celebrated his design. He prizes men. He prizes women. It means he infinitely treasures men as men, and he infinitely treasures women as women. And in a world that has had far too much oppression and denigration of women, we come today in Romans 16 to see Paul lauding, honoring, and commending women. And it goes far to displace, to replace one of the worst lies that has been promulgated by the powers of hell in our culture, that somehow there has been this notion that Christianity has been bad for women. And today, in a different sort of message, in a different sort of text, as we start nearing the conclusion of our year-long study of Romans, I want to show to you, I want to prove to you, I want to celebrate with you how the gospel is the best news ever for women. Okay, since there have been uh, far too much denigration of uh, women, let's start with some blatantly uh, sexist humor in the opposite direction of that. What do you call a man who has lost 95% of his brain power? A widower. <laughs> or, or here's another one. My wife referred this one to me. A doctor told his patient that he needed a brain transplant. A brain transplant, the patient said. I didn't even know such a thing was possible. Yes, said the doctor, we can do it. Said, you just need to know whether you want a male brain or a female brain. He said, I must let you know the male brain is $400,000. The female brain is $200,000. Why is the female brain so much cheaper? The patient said, because the doctor replied, it has been used. <laughs> it's much more expensive to get one of those fresh, unused male brains. One more, one more, ridiculous. After being married for 50 years, a man looked at his wife one day and said, 50 years ago, I had a dilapidated one-bedroom house, a clunker of a car, slept on a sofa bed, and watched a 10-inch black-and-white TV. But I got to sleep with a hot 23-year-old woman every night. 
Now, he said, I have a $500,000 house, a $45,000 car, a king-size bed, a 70-inch high-definition TV, but I'm sleeping with an old woman. Doesn't seem like you're keeping up your end of the bargain. What are you going to do about that? The wife responded, well, here's what we do. Why don't you go out and find you a hot 23-year-old girl to sleep with, and I'll make sure that once again you're sleeping in a dilapidated one-bedroom house, driving a clunker, sleeping on the sofa bed, and watching a 10-inch TV. <laughs> Uh, God infinitely treasures men and He infinitely treasures women. Many years ago, I, was, uh, I had an idea. It was uh, Valentine's Day, landing on a Sunday, and I thought we would honor the women by giving every woman, married, single, young, old, a red rose, and I was preparing to preach a simple message from Genesis about <clears throat> men honoring, defending, protecting women. And while I was preparing for the message, in my little study at home, I had a visitation from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I don't say it lightly. I know God's with us all the time, but it was a sort of visitation where all of a sudden a, a beautiful and awful wonderful and terrible kind of conviction began settling upon me as I saw uh, for myself and on behalf of men everywhere, just maybe for a moment, a little glimpse of how God has seen mistreatment of women, the objectification of women, the hurt and oppression against women, and just how much God treasured women, and I began to weep. What resulted is that indeed on that Sunday morning we, we had something that smelled a lot like heaven where men were handing out roses to each woman there saying a rose for a rose and I read out a confession on behalf of men and many other men joined me in that and something about that experience changed me, shifted something inside of me. Because sometimes it's not until you can see through God's eyes that you really experience a kind of transformation. And I, I, I revisit some of those thoughts today as I think about this unique text where Paul lauds and commends so many women that he'd ministered alongside of. It flies in the face, this idea of uh, God honoring women and the church honoring women, it flies in the face of um, a cultural narrative that uh, has been propagated by hell that says the opposite. Perhaps it's because there has been too much religious dishonoring of women and it has become fodder for hell to make this deception <coughs> prevalent. I remember some years ago, uh, one of our college uh, freshmen returned home for Thanksgiving holiday from her prestigious university. And she approached me, she said, Pastor Allen, I've been taking a women's studies course. And she said, I, I didn't know, she was troubled. She said, I didn't know Christianity has been so bad for women. I said, what, what, what do you mean? She said, you know how Christianity has oppressed women over the centuries and held them back. <clears throat> and I said, really? I said, well, I'm not sure what history your professor is teaching, but I just want to know, has she pointed to the radical and risky work of Christians over all the centuries in all kinds of cultures to help educate women, to care for pregnant women, to seek an end to oppressive and superstitious practices that hurt women? Did she talk about Christian missionaries like Alicia Little and John McCowan and Timothy Richard who worked to end the horrible practice of foot binding in China that so terribly disfigured and sometimes led to the amputation of the feet of little girls? Did, did your professor talk about how William Carey, a missionary and evangelist, worked to end the prevalent Hindu custom of sati, where it was expected uh, that a widow would throw herself alive onto the fires that were cremating her dead husband because the widow wasn't honored? Had, did, was there any discussion about how it really was the missionaries that have been the ones who worked to to stop and put an end to the infanticide of female babies. I went on like this. She said, no, 
No, she didn't mention any of that. My professor didn't talk about that. I said, wow. I said, it sounds like you've only heard part of the story. And I said, surely, if you've been being educated about wrong-minded Christians over the centuries in different places and different times who might have held women back, there, there must have been a significant section this semester about how fundamentalist Islamic cultures have oppressed women terribly and treated them like, like property and, 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 and kept back all of their rights to where they're not educated, maybe can't even drive a car. And she said, no, we haven't discussed any of, of that. Man, I was just sad to sit there and think of a college freshman sitting under a PhD professor who's hearing only part of the story or hearing just the, the wrong story. And I don't think that people in our culture understand the beautiful and radical way that all New Testament theology honors women. I remember a conversation also that I had many years ago with a friend of mine whose mother was a professional uh, Christian educator in a liberal denomination. And he just made offhandedly the comment uh, that his mother said that she didn't like the Apostle Paul very much because he said all those things against women. And I don't want to just today in a different sort of message set the record straight as we look at this text. But I, 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 want, I want to take you into a more intimate look at Paul's heart and into the heart of God, that in defiance of that patriarchal oppressive culture in which they were in in the Greco-Roman world of the first century, that there is the best news ever in the Christian gospel that we see in Jesus and Paul in all of the New Testament. So I just want to start and take a little bit of a closer look at some of these names. This is the kind of section of scripture that you might just, if you're in your devotionals, you might just read right over this to get onto something better. But there's a reason God included this in the Word of God. And, and I want to look at some of this. Paul routinely greeted people by name in his letters, but this is unusual because here in chapter 16, uh, Paul is greeting 26 individuals and two families and three house churches. Look at verse 1. Uh, again, I'm reading from Dr. Douglas Moo's uh, translation of this. I think it's just very helpful and accurate. Now, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who's also a deacon of the church at Sincrea, in order that you might receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in the matter in which she has need of you. For she has herself also been a benefactor of many and of me myself. Phoebe was probably, scholars think, delivering the letter to the Romans. Imagine that. Paul was entrusting this woman that had worked alongside of him to be the one, the ambassador, that would actually carry the epistle to the Romans, the greatest theological treasure perhaps ever written in the history of the world. She's called a diakonos, which can mean servant or minister or deacon. By whatever name, she was an important leader. She also was a benefactor, the Greek word prostatos, like a patron. Paul uses this word often to mean to direct or to preside over. Probably doesn't mean that she was the official, uh, the officiant of the church, but she was so important uh, there. And then for the next 16 verses, Paul begins a sentence with an exhortation to greet a person or persons on his behalf. 16 verses. Why so many people? Um, Paul had never even been to Rome, so it's kind of unusual that for the church he never had visited, he lists more people here than any other place. Maybe some have thought Paul's listing every single person he knows in the Roman church. But how could he have known them if uh, he'd never been there? Well, the only way he knew him was he knew him from other contexts and other uh, places of ministry. And what had happened was the Roman Emperor Claudius had ordered the expulsion of all Jews from Rome around A.D. 49, including the Jewish Christians. And he thought they were agitating things, so he, he expelled them all. So they all had to flee Rome. And they went to different places. And then at Claudius' death, when the uh, edict was lifted, they returned to Rome. So likely that's what happened. He met all these people, maybe in Corinth, in Ephesus, and other places where he'd been ministering, and now he knew that they were safely back at their home in Rome. And so he was calling by name. Look at some of these. Verse 3 and 4. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their neck on behalf of my soul, whom not only I alone, but also all the churches of the Gentiles thank. Just hear the gratitude in his heart. He, he, he 
felt like they helped save his life. Greet also the church of, of, of their house. So they had a house church. Prisca is also called by Luke Priscilla. And he tells us that uh, Priscilla and Aquila were originally from Pontus. They came from Italy. And because we're told in Acts 18, they were victims of that edict from Claudius that made they had to leave Rome. They were also tent makers like Paul. They did ministry in Corinth and then in Ephesus. And we speculate, but, but likely when Paul says they helped save his life, talking about a big riot at the amphitheater in Ephesus where um, this woman Aquila, I mean, this woman, Priscilla, along with her husband, Aquila, risked her life to save Paul. Verse 6, greet Mary, who worked hard for you. We don't know which Mary this is, um, just that she was a hard worker on behalf of the people of God. Romans 16, 7, greet Andronicus and Junia, my kindred and fellow prisoners who are esteemed among the apostles and who were in Christ before me. So these are fellow Jews. There's a chance Junia uh, might actually be Junius, a man, but almost all scholars think Junia is correct and she's female. And it's notable because she's mentioned amongst the apostles. The translation here is a little tricky. It either means she was considered outstanding by the apostles or she was outstanding amongst the apostles. And most agree that what Paul's saying here is that she was not an apostle with a capital A, like the 12 original apostles who witnessed Jesus' resurrection and had a special commission from Jesus, but an apostle with a little a, which means a sent one, a missionary, a minister in the name of Jesus. And uh, they had been uh, probably prisoners, uh, either right alongside of Paul at the same time or in another place, but they had a deep bond of that suffering. Um, verse 12, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. These are names that have been found in ancient inscriptions in connection with the imperial household. So they were probably slaves who had been set free. And uh, even from the, the imperial royal court. And they were sisters probably. Maybe even some have said twins. Persis, a slave or freed woman. And her name means Persian woman. Look at verse 13 and 14. Greet Rufus, the elect in the Lord, his mother and mine. It's a beautiful thing that Paul is highlighting. Not only Rufus, who he highlights is like every believer chosen in Christ, but also please greet his mother, who he's saying was a spiritual mother to me as well. Hospitality, comfort, and courage, strength, and pray and helping Paul when he needed help. It's beautiful. Paul had a spiritual mother. Look at verse 15. Greet Philologus and Julia, Neros and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints with them. Philologus with Julia probably means they were husband and wife. Neros, the man, his sister, could be the children of Philologus and Julia. You know, when you look at this list, one of the things you first notice is what a wonderful diversity of this interesting people. Most of them are Gentile, some are Jewish, some are are names from prominent families, and some are clearly the names that were associated with former slaves. And we learn not only that there was this diversity that was there, but we learned that there was this wonderful, just effortless and without fanfare, but very clear, specific lifting out of nine of these as women, five of whom are commended for their ministry. And it seems like that it was just a very natural thing for Paul to do. To understand how radical this is, to see this in a letter from someone as great as the Apostle Paul, you have to understand it against the backdrop of the denigration of women in the Greco-Roman world. In order to understand the contrast, let me see if maybe I could illustrate it like this. If you were to just read a story of history about a woman who was asked to move from her seat on a bus so someone else could have her seat and she refused to move, you might not think that was that big of a deal until you read the real story about how at 6 p.m. on Thursday, December 1 in 1955 in downtown Montgomery, an African woman, African-American woman named Rosa paid her fare, stepped onto a bus operated by the Montgomery city lines. And during the ride, she refused to give up her seat because she was sitting in the section that is reserved for the blacks. 
But then the bus driver, seeing that more white people had gotten on, he moved the sign so that now she was sitting in the area designated for the whites. And she was told to move and she wouldn't move. You'd have to know that there was a city ordinance from 1900 in Montgomery that required blacks to sit near the rear of the bus. You'd have to know that that they could sit in the middle of the bus until white people came onto the bus, in which case the black people had to move to the back and give up their seats. You'd have to know that on that day that Rosa Parks was not old and she was not tired, as some have supposed. No, she was a young woman and she just had had it and she sat there. You'd have to know a lot about the horrors of racism and segregation of a whole group of people who were who were scapegoated for the color of their skin. You'd have to understand all that to know what a big deal it was that day where she wouldn't move her seat. And what I'm saying is that it's like that, but even more so for Paul to, to, to so naturally, so fluently, so easily mention amongst all the people he was honoring in the Christian church, these women. You have to understand what the culture was like in which Paul was speaking. I begin with the opening words of the fourth chapter of Dr. Alvin Schmidt's book, How Christianity Changed the World. And he began that chapter with this word, what would be the status of women in the Western world today had Jesus Christ never entered the human arena? He says one way to answer this question is to look at the status of women in most present day Islamic countries. In other words, think of Taliban led cultures where women aren't allowed to be educated or maybe drive a car or marry who they want to marry. That according to Many sociologists and historians, that is what the Western world would still look like today, except for the influence of Christianity. And Dr. Schmidt continues, the civil and humane behavior that is expected between husband and wife today, even by secular minded people, reflects the sea change effect Christ has had on the lives of women in marriage, especially in the West. It just as I've just spent hours and hours studying this week the ways that Greco-Roman culture denigrated women, it's, it turns my stomach. And I mean, just mention, starting with this, that in the Greco-Roman world of the first century, by some estimates, the world was as much as two-thirds male to one-third women. It may have been that at one point that of all the population, almost two thirds were all men. And part of the reason for this is the infanticide of baby girls. We have ancient letters and inscriptions that tell of the practice, like a letter from a husband who wrote this lovely letter to his wife and said that while he was away working on a job, he said, if you're lucky and the baby is born a male, let it live. If it is a female, then cast it out. They would take their baby girls and expose them to the elements so that they would die. The female child was considered a liability. Let that horror sink in for a moment. Don't don't just gloss over it as a little piece of, 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 of history in some faraway place. Just let it sink in. That's the culture into which Paul was writing Romans 16, a Greco Roman world where many, many, many would kill their baby girls. They didn't even want them. There was so much male oppression of women that Schmidt writes, in ancient Greece, a respectable woman was not allowed to leave the house unless she was accompanied by a trustworthy male escort. A wife was not permitted to eat or interact with male guests in her husband's home. She had to retire to her woman's quarters. Men kept their wives under lock and key. Women had the social status of a slave. Girls were not allowed to go to school. They grew up, they were not allowed to speak in public. Women were considered inferior to men. In fact, the Greek poets equated women with evil. Remember Pandora and her box. The only woman, he writes, in that culture that had some freedom was the hetera or mistress who often accompanied a married man when he attended events outside the home. It was just not even frowned on. And and he continues, the status of Roman women women was also so low. Roman law placed a wife under absolute control of her husband who had ownership of her and all her possessions. The husband had power of life and death over his wife, just as he did his children. And as with the Greeks, most uh, women were not allowed to speak in public. Sadly, between especially 400 AD and a couple of centuries after Christ, a lot of not the scriptures themselves, but Jewish writings, Midrash and commentary, became strongly oppressive to women as well. So in the synagogue worship, women were segregated. Women couldn't speak. It was a culture and Roman law of patria potestas, which meant that the 
The man in the household had absolute control over the wife and children, even more remote descendants. He even had the right to inflict capital punishment. He could kill them. In Greco-Roman culture, adultery was defined only in terms of the woman's marital status, not the man's. A man, married or single, could be accused of adultery with another man's wife because she was considered his property, not because it was morally wrong. Adultery was a property offense. And if a married woman slept with a single or married man, she was always guilty of adultery. So because of this, and because if she was accused of adultery, her husband could have her executed. It was discovered by historians that often women would register with the government as a prostitute. Married women register as a prostitute so that she was no longer seen as exclusively belonging to her husband so that she could not be legally accused of adultery and potentially given the death penalty by her husband under the Roman law of patria potestas. And, and before Christianity, the records show that Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, men commonly married child brides as young as 11 or 12, pre-puberty. It's corroborated by Plutarch's writings about Justinian's institutes. And by the time of Christ, the veiling of women was widespread. Sumerians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, Hebrews, Chinese, and Romans. This is the kind of culture that Jesus came into. It was in this sort of world, a world where women were treated as property on the same level as slaves, a world where women had no rights, no property, no honor. Jesus came to a culture that didn't allow a woman to be educated or to speak outside her home. He came into a government that gave the man full power even to execute his own wife or children. Jesus came into a world where parents didn't want their infant girls and wish they hadn't been born at all. He came into that sort of world and he rocked that world with his unprecedented treasuring of women. And the gospel accounts are just teeming with stories of Jesus's radical encounters, counterculturally interacting with women, speaking to a Samaritan woman at a well, who had a long checkered past advocating for a woman caught in adultery who was about to be stoned to death, ministering very close to two women, Mary and Martha. The famous story of Martha busy in the kitchen, Mary at his feet was scandalous because it was shocking that Mary would sit at his feet the way a disciple would, learning, being educated. Jesus chose to tell women of his resurrection and to spread the news. Women went with him and ministered and provided. Luke records this in Luke 8, 1 to 3. Soon after, he went on to cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him and also some women who'd been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. Mark 15, 41, when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered him. And there are also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. He had women who traveled with him. He had women that ministered with him. He healed women. He allowed women to come near to anoint him. He upended the patriarchal right to divorce for almost no reason. And he said, instead, I say, whoever divorces his wife except for unfaithfulness commits adultery. He just... He loved the women. He honored them and treasured them because God infinitely and perfectly treasures all people the same. Dorothy Sayers, a contemporary and friend of C.S. Lewis, who <coughs> was, uh, a, 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 a wrote novels, but also uh, some profound Christian literature, had this to say, perhaps it is no wonder that the women were the first at the cradle <coughs> and last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There had never been such another, a prophet and teacher who never nagged at them, never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made jokes about them, never treated them as the women, God help us, or the ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without querulousness and praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no ax to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend, who took them as he found them, was completely unselfconscious. There is no act, no sermon, no parable in the whole gospel that borrows its pungency from female perversity. Nobody could possibly guess from the words and deeds of Jesus that there was anything funny about a woman's nature. <laughs>
The women loved Jesus. They flocked to him. Of course they did. They'd never been treated like this. They'd never seen someone like this. They'd never heard something like this. And Paul, who knew Jesus so intimately, he knew and he had the very spirit of Jesus vibrantly moving through him and through his pen. And so he himself honors the women in a radically countercultural way. I mean, in the first place, his completely countercultural view of marriage and a culture which men treated their wife like property. He says in Ephesians 5, 20, 28, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. He said in Ephesians 5, 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. Let each of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. He speaks of them in mutual submission. He speaks of a love that is sacrificial. He leaks of something that's unheard of in his culture. Not only were women welcome to the fellowship of the house churches, but they were often the hosts, the facilitators of the whole meeting. Aphia, a leader in the house church in Colossae, Philemon 2. Nympha had a church in her house in Laodicea. And as we've mentioned, Priscilla and her husband, a church in Ephesus and Philippians Paul speaks of Iodia and Syntyche, who, he says, contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. And of course, in Galatians, he finally just says it outright. Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free, nor male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Do you see what he's saying? Can you imagine how radical this is to say that women, just as much as men, are co-heirs with Christ in that Greco-Roman culture? And what happened from this was the rise of the Christian gospel and Christianity and the blessing of women. I wish I could give you all of this research that I've seen, but mention a few scholars have been surprised and fascinated by the Christian catacombs under Rome. In examining nearly 4,000 tombs of these Christians, they realized that almost to the same extent, Christian women were nearly as likely to have long commemorative inscriptions on their tombs which was unheard of in the rest of Roman culture. So Christianity emerged as something that was completely other and unusual. Men didn't marry child brides. They married older, more mature women. They treated their wives with honor rather than property. They didn't hastily divorce their wives. They didn't lord over them. And these Christian women became very influential for the spread of the gospel. Sociologist Rodney Stark has written extensively about the impact of Christianity on the world, and he's pointed out the convergence of several realities, that in the first century, as we've learned, there were far less women there were, than there were men. And then those women were so powerfully attracted to the gospel that they were being converted quicker than the men. And so now, proportionately, you have way more female Christians than you do male Christians. And a lot of those women, Christians, are married to pagans who eventually themselves come to Christ. And and the Christians also weren't killing their baby girls. And so you put all that together and, and suddenly you realize that the rise of Christianity is in large part because of this honoring of women who had been so denigrated and now they're changing the world. It depended on women. And eventually a Christian emperor outlawed patria potesta and Western civilization and the role of women began to change. And wherever in the world there's not been much Christian influence, women are still treated like property. Baby girls are still unwanted. Women aren't educated and are often hidden behind a veil and can never use their gifts in society. There's so much more that I could mention. I don't have time to address and apologize for any of the ways that wrong-minded Christians have been oppressive towards women. That certainly has happened. The few scant texts that are puzzling where Paul speaks of not allowing women to speak in the public gatherings deserve explanation. Surely he didn't mean they can't speak because he in the very same epistle where he said that, spoke about the guidelines for women prophesying in their meetings. (laughs) But I just want to say, imagine you were there. You were there when Phoebe delivered the epistle to the Romans. Uh, The custom was when 
a letter like this would arrive for the church from Paul, they would gather the Christians in the assembly and they'd read it aloud. Imagine you're there. Just imagine you're one of those women. Could you do it? Imagine that after hearing the most definitive theological explanation of salvation by grace and justification by Christ's atoning work alone and imputed righteousness to every believer, the clarification of the relationship of Israel and Gentiles and the powerful chapters that follow all about what grace-filled, spirit-empowered Christian living looks like. And then it comes to this concluding part at chapter 16, and you're there. Imagine you're Phoebe. Can you imagine it? You grew up in a culture that threw away baby girls. You'd experienced from different forms of religion that treated women like they didn't matter at all. A government that allowed men to execute their own wives. And now you've been filled up in your heart by hearing all of this letter read. And then it comes to the words that are read aloud in front of all the men and women that are gathered around you. And you hear it said, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is also a deacon of the church at Sincrea. And or you might receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, assist her, help her. She herself has been a patron, a benefactor of many. And the great apostle Paul says, and she's really helped me also, myself. Greet Phoebe. You're Phoebe and you hear it. <laughs> what honor. Everyone's smiling at you. Imagine, imagine you're Prisca, Priscilla. You were there in Ephesus when the riot broke out. You'd walk those streets of Ephesus, Ephesus where you could see the old Roman roads that still show symbols. You can see them today. I've seen them. Symbols on the public streets pointing the direction to the brothels. You'd seen how that culture treated a woman like a slave. Mistresses and prostitutes, only women seen in public without their husband. And you remember how the Holy Spirit gave you courage and strength and wisdom to lay it all on the line and help rescue Paul against a great riot. You're, you're Priscilla, you're sitting there in that meeting and suddenly you hear, and greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risk their neck on behalf of my soul, whom not only I alone, but also all the churches of Gentiles thank. Thank you. You're in the room, you're hearing it. How do you feel now? Greet Mary, maybe you're Mary, and you just hear who worked hard for you. Nobody maybe knew who you were, but suddenly you're, you're elevated. Uh, imagine your Junia sitting in that room. Like Paul, you'd been in prison for your beliefs. You'd been joyously, zealously proclaiming the gospel, perhaps prophesying and being used by God for signs and wonders. And you're sitting there in the house church, having listened to this marvelous theology in this letter. You're surrounded by a culture in which women aren't allowed to speak in public. And suddenly you hear and greet Andronicus and Junia, my kindred and fellow prisoners who are esteemed among the apostles. Did he say apostles? Yes, counted, esteemed amongst them. Maybe you're one of the twin sisters who'd worked so hard in the ministry in Corinth or Ephesus. No one else in the world knows your name. You once had been slaves and the next words you hear read, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa. How do you feel? Or imagine you're an older woman, mother to Rufus, and you had cared for Paul. You had helped house him. You'd been with him in the secret times when the apostle was tired, when he needed someone to nurture him, when he needed someone to feed him, to bind his wombs, to pray for him, to understand his humanity and his exhaustion and to remind him of the goodness of God. And you wonder if Paul remembers those times and then you hear, greet Rufus, the elect and the Lord, his mother and mine, my spiritual mom, greet one another. And all of a sudden the church is laughing and weeping and rejoicing and hugging and greeting one another with a holy kiss. And all of those who've been named are being, are being heralded and commended and rejoiced in. You know what it's a picture of? It's a picture not just of the church on earth, but the church in heaven. For you, beloved, all who are in Christ, who might not have been recognized on earth, might not have been known, might even have been persecuted, hurt, defamed, or denigrated. When you come to the great assembly, 
of heaven, Christians, you will be the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy who said, Now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You're the sheep of His pasture, of which Jesus spoke in John 10. To Him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear His voice, and He calls His own sheep by name. You, beloved in Christ, chosen in Him, saved by the blood, imputed with His righteousness, are the ones Jesus spoke of when He said in Luke 10, 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I don't know how it will be or how many saints will be gathered, but I believe there will be a great reading from the Lamb's Book of Life. And you, saints of God, men, women, treasured by God, will hear your name read aloud. And all the saints rejoice because God infinitely treasures men and God infinitely treasures women. And that's the real story. And that's the gospel.